the night after watching it, I lay in bed just staring at the ceiling, thinking to myself, like, I need to detransition. I went through an incredibly rigorous diagnostic um, period, and I still ended up detransitioning. But that is just a statistical inevitability. No matter how airtight you try to make mm. the system, there will always be detrans people, and we should always approach anyone's gender journey with compassion and care. I don't know what an obstacle is anymore. I've <laughs> I fought back against everything. I've beat the game, basically. Welcome to the Trans Boss Podcast, home of the Trans Boss Movement, the place where empowered trans people come to discover what it takes to become the best versions of themselves. I'm your host, Jasmine Vine, a trans femme, trans empowerment specialist, and the CEO of Javine, and I'm here to guide you on this empowering journey. In each episode, we'll dive deep into topics that matter to us trans people, like navigating through societal challenges, as well as building resilience and embracing an empowering mindset. We'll explore it all. We'll also bring on some incredible guests who are making a positive impact in the trans community. The Trans Boss Podcast is your go-to resource for empowerment, hope, wisdom, and epic stories from empowered trans bosses across the globe. It's time to kick life's ass and create an empowered, authentic you. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Hello, 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 and welcome to this episode of the Trans Boss Podcast. So I'm really excited today because we are joined by Lucy Katakasari, who is a D-trans woman and passionate advocate for trans and D-trans solidarity. She is a resilient and empowering woman, a, and she bravely shares her experiences online from her initial social transition at age 12 to her D-transition journey, which started at age 26, as well as the shame that surrounded that decision as well. So her hope is to show that detransition is a non-political, neutral act and like anything else is deserving of compassion and understanding. So Lucy speaks compassionately against the harmful victimization of detransitioners by the right wing, emphasizing the importance of unity and solidarity. So welcome Lucy to the Transpost podcast. Woo! Hi Jasmine, Hello. thank you for having me on. <laughs> thank you for being here. So when I first saw you online was probably a couple of months ago and some of the things that I saw you posting about really having that um, compassionate view of things and sharing things about your experience in such a way that just felt so empowered. And I don't remember what video it was that I watched, but I saw one where you were talking about like, um, I'm never going to allow myself to be a victim and allowing yourself to make mistakes on the transition journey and all of that. And it just, I was binging. I'm like, oh my goodness, this person, I need to have her on my podcast. <laughs> well, thank you for the support. Appreciate it. It was very freaking beautiful. <laughs> um, and I can see as well, you've chosen to do a lot of healing on your journey because that empowerment I can see being quite strong in you. Quite strong. I've had to work hard to get to where I'm at. Um, and it, it, like the, the confidence and the woman I am today was, um, it was hard won. It took a while yeah. uh, to get here. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. So a few rapid questions. How do you identify and what are your pronouns? So my pronouns are she, they, he. Um, I yep. don't really have that strong of a preference or more like I don't really care. Um, and uh, as for how I identify, I identify exclusively as detrans um, and I am a woman. So uh, I have a, a bit of a different view on uh, gender. Um, I don't really see a cis trans as a binary where you have to like choose between mm -hmm. one of the flavors. I feel like there's uh, way more, uh, way more categories. Um, yeah. So D-trans, um, uh, this is getting out of my rapid question, but I want to know what D-trans actually means to you and what that means as an identity for you. Okay, so where D-trans comes from is like specifically the word detransitioning. Um, so that's specifically about the medical um, process where you like reverse or undo uh, one's transition. Um, but D-trans for me personally actually comes from... Um, detransgender and mm -hmm. specifically the D in detransgender 
means of or from, so of transgender origin. Um, so it's kind of more like post-trans than anything else. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that's the label that you feel meshes with you identity-wise the most? Yeah, it it, um, yeah, nice. it encapsulates my experience, my initial transition, and then my yeah. second transition, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. The other rapid questions. What is something that you believe in? Wow. Okay. Uh, just a sentence. Just <laughs> something I <laughs> believe in. It. God damn. That that's a, that's a that's a lot. Uh, at eleven p.m. nearly midnight. Um, <laughs> what do I believe in? Um, compassion. I just believe in compassion um, to other people, but most of all towards yourself, because you're never going to make it to. You're never going to make it out of your 20s without having done something that makes you go like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Or like, maybe that wasn't the right path. And that can be anything from transition to um, a bad relationship. It could be anything. But the main point is that you have to be merciful and forgiving towards yourself because at the time you were working with the best information you had, I think. Yeah. 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 Oh love that i want to go into all sort of deep dives around that but <laughs> rapid questions <laughs> yeah yeah rapid this is another one that's a rapid one that i'd love to dive into but what do you want to see more of in the world what i want to see more of in the world um is it corny to say compassion again <laughs> i don't think Just, so i feel like that it's that's really what it is because i feel like so much of our world today is built up on hating and tearing other people down and not wanting to listen to another perspective because mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't align entirely with how you view the world um that's not to say that we have to give space for bigots because the core value is um kindness it is operating mm -hmm. under the assumption that everyone is entitled to um navigate life the way they want to and yeah yeah you don't know this is why i wanted to have you on the podcast <laughs> Um, oh, I'm really, really happy like to be that's... here. Oh, like compassion and kindness is something that is kind of missing or it's very much lessened, um, particularly online with all the hate that's put out there. It's been and quite And it's very easy to yeah. make quick judgments. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And actually, there's probably been a lot of quick judgments or that I, I've seen quick judgments made of you, like in your comment sections, that just because you're detrans, that you're going to be some right wing person saying no one should be able to access gender affirming care, which is clearly not you. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because uh, yesterday in my live stream, someone showed up um, and they identified as non-binary and mm. um, apparently uh, so. I normally wear glasses and I don't wear them when I live stream because of the reflection on my lenses. But oh. uh, I squinted at my screen when they wrote non-binary mm. and they immediately framed it as an attack on them. They were like, oh, I saw you pulled a face when you when you, I said I was non-binary. Wow. And it's like I had to literally be like, OK, NB check and get everyone who identifies as non-binary to actually um, present themselves in the chat and be like, actually, um, no she's not nb phobic what are you talking about um and then they started accusing me of like posting propaganda and whatnot um and then everyone started riffing off that <laughs> like oh yeah, well i detransitioned right. after watching lucy's content <laughs> um mm, interesting. yeah so people make assumptions yeah. all the time absolutely oh that's a whole other thing that's just so prevalent when people have a certain idea or they don't accept themselves fully, I feel that can happen yes. a lot more. Um, I can, viewing can I and that? filtering things. Yeah, please do. So what I've noticed is that the majority of people who have a problem with the way I identify, mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority are people under 20. And I'm not trying to be ageist, but I understand that mm -hmm. for a lot of baby trans people, you know, young trans people, they want to kind of, prove their identity and i've noticed that there's a lot more um let's say uh quick judgments from them and i can look at that and think to myself like i was very similar when i was their age 
and I can forgive mm. it that way because it's like okay I understand it's it is a projection of that insecurity because you're still young and it's going to take a while before you develop confidence to see another person have an identity and respect it for what it is yeah yeah so yeah very true and I know um because we spoke about previously about really young trans people uh who were the ones that kind of actively against the things that you were posting Mm -hmm. because it felt like an attack to them it felt like it was something that was going to take away their rights or something like that yeah I, I see that um, a lot of these young trans people, I guess, are also, uh, they haven't had time to be in the community long enough to see other people's identity evolve, uh, evolve around them. So people who might switch mm-hmm. from a binary trans identity to a non-binary identity, like that they haven't interacted with enough queers, basically. Us elder queers are just yeah. like, they, they don't know anything about what happens after you leave high school and then you start entering queer spaces where you can actually express yourself and be more free than you can in a, in a high school it's it's a different world mm. and so i just want to have empathy for i know it's like it's always water off a duck's back when i get negative comments uh like that i yeah. i'm not bothered by it anymore how do you actually approach those types of comments? How is it water off a duck's back for you? Um, so I have uh, this mental framework, I guess, um, since I've started creating content. And I knew when I started making content that if I got any attention for what I was doing, I was going to catch a lot of heat because to mm-hmm. be an openly detrans person, um, you're going to have right-wingers acting buddy-buddy to you and then calling you a freak behind your back. You're going to have um, people on the left who are so, um, primarily young trans people again, who are so against your existence that they just write you off as someone who, you know, spreads propaganda or whatever. And um, so I knew all this was going to happen and I just don't care. And I know that that sounds really corny, but I have literally about 15 people in my life who I know and love, people who I envision sitting at this, like, this table. And if every single one of them can, would say, Lucy, you're doing a good job with what you're doing, that's enough for me. I don't need to think about anyone else. Everything else is just noise or it's, um... It's something that you can turn into uh, content. I've seen other trans creators, other queer creators being like, hey, watch me make money off this bigot by um, <laughs> sharing uh, comments or and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, just kind of clowning on people that way because that's, it doesn't matter. Mm. That person is never going to meet you. They're never going to be your friend. Um, and I like to think compassionately, this is where the compassion comes in, is that if I were to ever meet this person, and actually sit down and have a conversation and have a conversation with them that they would actually understand my perspective a bit better and that we could actually be friends. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. A lot of the time it's just this scary unknown and people have their own misconceptions. They've been exposed to whatever propaganda they've been exposed to. And so oftentimes when you think about it that way, you can approach with so much more compassion because it's like, well, I don't know this person. I don't know what they've been through. (laughs) I know nothing about them. Um, And like, um, that's how I. And I absolutely freaking love that table analogy. Oh my goodness. I think everyone should do that. I'm going to start doing that. (laughs) I feel like that's also, um, it's kind of a a thing about Dutch culture as well, since I moved from Australia to the Netherlands. and I don't, I don't remember that much of like Australian culture. Maybe it's still baked into me, but I do know that it is typically Dutch to just not care when someone has an unflattering opinion of you. Mm. It's just kind of like, okay, that's your, that's your take on me. That's fine. It's, it's not really going to do yeah. much for me anyway. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I just think this... it's a, uh, is it a Simpsons meme? Thanks. This is useless. Throw it away. Yeah. Am I supposed yeah. to? Uh... Do with this. It's uh, it's worthless. Mm. I why, why I don't care about it. Yeah, that's a really yeah. interesting perspective, because a lot of the time it's like, 
it's about the feeling for me is like, does this actually help me? Does this help anyone else? Does it make the world a better place? If the answer is no, leave it behind. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's really cool. So in the spirit of compassion, for, especially for those younger people as well, um, I mentioned earlier, like you began your social transition at age 12. So I'd love to know your experience and the journey of coming to that decision. Like initially, what made you feel that you were trans at that time? So when I was 11 or 12, somewhere about that, I think I was 11, I, um, I came across like the concept of being trans in um, sex ed and mm-hmm. I had an instant like connection of like, okay, well, I must be a boy because when that was happening, I felt quite alienated by my own body. I was not coping well with puberty. And now mm-hmm. in hindsight, I know that I was struggling with pretty severe body dysmorphia. Um, but at the time, I mean, it was also like compounded by the fact that amongst my sisters, I was relatively more tomboyish. I, um, I, I just liked more androgynous things. And so I started researching and I came to describe that what I was experiencing, what I was experiencing as gender dysphoria. And um, I, I told my dad when I was 12, like, dad, I think I'm mm. a boy. And he asked me, well, why do you think that? And I explained that uh, I, I identified as trans and that I thought I needed to transition to alleviate this discomfort I felt in my body. Um, Mm. What followed was years on a waiting list until I was 16 and I got my formal diagnosis on what would have been 2013, February 4th. Mm. Like I I remember it. I might get the year wrong, but I know that it was February 4th. That might be around Uh, about the same time that I did, just by the way. (laughs) Oh my gosh, okay. (laughs) something in the water (laughs) okay um but yeah so i had that realization i had that diagnosis moment and then i started shortly thereafter with um hormone blockers and then after that uh started taking testosterone so uh yeah that's that's and then i went through all these like um surgeries quite rapidly i must say uh, so after a year and a half of testosterone, I was allowed to have my top surgery. And then mm-hmm. six months after that, I um, had a ophrohysterectomy. And um, in hindsight, I think that at the time, I was so happy with the fact that I was on T that I didn't really stop to consider how I was feeling in my body at the time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of rushed through my surgeries in an attempt to undo the damage that puberty had done to me. That's how I viewed it, at least. Um, But um, we have to really, I have to to underscore this, like, so much. Um, The fact that I was happy after I had my surgeries... I was so happy with my life. I, my family, my, my dad in particular talks about my transition and how it was so positive for me and how I, I really blossomed. And throughout university, for instance, the friends I made, um, some of them also told me like, wow, you really become so much more yourself. And this was before any detransitioning occurred. I just kind of became more confident with time. And I really did consider myself a man um and then moving into like when i started i guess kind of i'm gonna call it spectrum sliding since we can't say gender bending anymore (laughs) uh but kind of (laughs) moving uh towards a trans masculine non-binary identity around the time of the pandemic my dad got really sick and uh i was the only son in the family so i had to step up Mm. and be man of the house whilst my dad was um, I sent like for reference, he was dying of COVID early in the pandemic. Um, he survived, but that was like a really traumatic moment that made me realize, like, oh my god, I have to 
step up, be a man. Then once he got better, I could finally let go of that. I was like, okay, now I can just focus on me. I've done what I needed to do. Uh, so I stopped caring about um, presenting as mask all the time. <coughs> Sorry. And I, um, I, I, I started shifting in my identity into 2020, 2022. Yeah, so around May of 2022, I Mm. uh, started laser hair uh, removal on my face because I was tired of my facial hair. (coughs) Don't worry, we're getting to the end. (laughs) Um, And uh, I started, I met my boyfriend at the time, my ex-boyfriend, and he came from quite a right-wing family and they they kind of pushed me into a more feminine social role. And... um, I, I realized that I was okay with that. It didn't really bother me. I He would still call me his boyfriend, his partner. Mm. He u- generally used gender neutral terms to refer to me. Um, and I liked it very much that he respected my identity in that way. Mm. But I was like, you know, like practically being someone's girlfriend, not too bad. I actually kind of like this. Um, mm. So... That all kind of, then after we broke up, um, I ended up watching the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. And I had a sort of like paradigm shift in my head because I realized like I was thinking about the themes of the movie, the whole idea of like how every path you take in your life can lead you to a new universe. And I thought to myself, Mm -hmm. but what if I just took a, did a U-turn or like took a really hard left, um, and just teleported to a universe where I'm a woman. And what would that look like? Um, so the night that I lay in bed, the night after watching it, I lay in bed just staring at the ceiling, thinking to myself, like, I need to detransition. Um, and that was a lot. And then one of my closest friends, uh, a few days later, came out to me as a trans woman. The very next day, I called her up and I was like, honey, I, 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 I'm going to detransition. So that's interesting. Like the reason for transitioning in the first place, a lot of people would describe that, like what you described as a pretty typical trans experience. And I'm interested to know from you, what do you think was different for you at that time? Or what do you know in hindsight that may have been the cause instead? I mean... I, it's hard to say because I was operating with such a different mindset and now I have the full picture. Um, mm. But at the time, I think it was less so that I wanted to be a man and um, and it had more to do with I really didn't want to be a woman and I find it hard to navigate conversations about this because this narrative is often weaponized by TERFs. Mm. They like to say... Oh, see, it's the patriarchy's fault. And I'm like, okay, but multiple things can be true. I can be, in that sense, a victim of the patriarchy, but that does not take away a trans person's need to transition, nor nor should it take their right uh, to transition away from them. So I just think that it's a little bit um, short-sighted when a lot of people say that, oh, if it's the case for you, then it must be the case for everyone else. And it's like, no, it's a bit more nuanced than that. so yeah it was it was very much like i just really didn't want to be a woman and i felt that on some level i was going to fail at it um just due to the way my body was i was very critical of my appearance and since i already had quite a few what i perceived to be masculine traits it kind of eased the idea of transitioning so um some people find it strange that becoming more masculine helped me that it alleviated my dysphoria and that it didn't make me more ups- mm. uh, uncomfortable but i really i mean towards especially towards the end of my uh transition uh initial transition before the detransition i was in pretty good shape like i i, I liked my body in that way um yeah i and i don't think that i'm wrong for having felt that way about myself it's just that i I like this one a bit better. They're both good. They're both my body. They're just different versions of it. Um, 
Yeah. It's really interesting because that is one thing that I did want to talk about is the confusion around that. Because I, I will say, like, I felt a little bit confused listening to that part of your story as well, where I was like, oh, mm -hmm. wouldn't it kind of trigger to go, oh, this isn't kind of for me. And it just shows that gender can be such an expansive and fluid kind of thing. Yeah. And when I was listening to that, because I think I heard you talk about that on a TikTok at one point, sure, I thought about, I, um, I thought about parts of my own journey and thinking like, there's masculine parts about myself that I really don't mind or that I've leaned into. I've even wanted to mm -hmm. create like a drag king persona at some point just because I thought that would be fun. I would love to see um, that. <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah, having that understanding that it can shift and you can be okay in different areas and it's not about I'm one or the other, it's about what do I like the mm -hmm. most. Yeah. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, so what would you say was like the core reason for the D transition? Cause if you were kind of like, yeah, I, you know, I don't mind how I am at the moment. I love, I'm in good shape, all that kind of stuff. What was the reason for starting the D transition? I think it was, it was the realization that I was developing a dis different kind of gender dysphoria. So like I had started yeah. laser hair removal and I realized that I really liked not having to shave my face. I did. I. I didn't. And prior to laser hair removal, you have to bear in mind I was shaving every day. I was plucking out hairs, and at one point, I was just like, "Well, this is getting a bit ridiculous." Um, so it didn't really click in my head. I was just like, "No, I like this more androgynous presentation of myself. I like uh, look. I like having long hair, muscle, and a smooth face. Like this is what I like." Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, it was like, okay, well, now I have this smooth face and this rocking body and luscious hair. Um, and I was dating my, my ex and uh, he kind of like, when I was with him, I was basically pushed more to hang around with his friend's girlfriends as well. So that also kind of like, maybe it was like, hmm, socially, I'm one of the girls now. And I kind of like it. And I guess it just was also like, but what if I just, and then obviously when the movie happened as well, when, when the movie happened, when I watched the movie, it, um, like it was an event. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for you, it kind yeah. of was, right? It was, it was. Yeah. And a lot of people, I, a few people have, uh, given me like, um, shit for that. They like, oh, a movie changed your mind about it. It's like, yeah, sometimes art is really moving. And this one yeah. happened to hit a lot of different story beats for me. And it was particularly that um, whole universe swipping, universe um, swapping thing, the whole traveling through the multiverse and kind of connecting to those versions of yourself. I could have detransitioned at any point I could have transitioned at any point I there no one can know how things were going to turn out and I just wanted to see what my life would be like and I realized that there were so many things that I was enjoying more about this more feminine social presentation that I was like okay but what if I just went all the way with it what would that look like um mm -hmm. I guess it was also like on some level I was I often felt that I had to hide part of myself um because I wasn't like uh, openly trans either. It was just kind of always left it like yeah. up in the open. No one knew how I was, uh, what I was assigned at birth, which was also mm. uh, pretty mm -hmm. interesting. I had to navigate very interesting shifting um, social perceptions of gender because there were times that people would assume that I was AFAB, other times people would assume that I was AMAB, and no one could quite figure it out. Um, mm. I was like, okay, well, this... Let's try this. Let's try this one. What's this going to be like? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because what I really love about you sharing like your side of that story is because it is something that is often weaponized, like particularly by TERFs and my right wing media and all of that. And it's probably something that a lot of people 
would struggle to wrap their mind around. And I think that's fantastic because when you expand that, great things can happen. So there's, ah, oh, there was something I was going to ask and it's just slipped my mind. What was it? <coughs> um, think on it while I cough. Because I think about, you know, the stories that are paraded around as, you know, this is why we shouldn't allow gender affirming healthcare and all of that kind of stuff. Um, some of them are not very different to, I guess, your experience, except it's the way you're, um, you know, talking about that experience and the expansiveness that you have with it that makes all the difference there. Because some people will, you know, there's, I don't have any names that pop to mind immediately, but there's <laughs> some popular detransitioners that kind of really push that narrative that if it was like that for them and for them it was, you know, insecurity or for them it was this or it was that, then that should be applicable for all trans people. And that's something that I think about, um, cause you know, when it comes to my own journey as well, I transitioned when I was fairly young, like socially when I was about 13, 14 and, um, throughout that experience, I find it understandable that people would latch onto a detransitioner's experience and go, ah, oh, well, maybe you just don't know because you've never, you know, experienced or whatever. But then I also think about what about the people who transition like in their fifties and they have spent a long time living a certain gender role and being in that box. And the same sort of thing is usually applied to them as well. But I'm like, how? Because they've tested that. They've well and truly tested that road for themselves. Um, I swear there was well, a yeah. question in this. <laughs> I mean, um, I guess, uh, how the difference in why I navigate this the way I do versus also to the whole um young trans people versus older trans people that boils down to yeah. you can never do it right as a trans person it does not matter what you do they're going to be well. bigots who uh, it, it's transphobia it's always transphobia it always comes back to queer phobia that is what it is um but yeah. as for why I navigate my detransition the way I do and how that differs mm. from um someone like um Chloe Cole, um, Prisha, uh, I don't know what her surname is, but she's pretty prominent. Um, yeah. I mean, what I think is, I've noticed a lot of them are younger than me, and a lot of mm. them did transition as minors, but I think that the main thing is that I have lived with this body, with my transitioned body, um, for nearly a full decade now. I had my top surgery at 19. I'm 27 now. I'm going to be 28 pretty soon. So I have had so much time to get used to this body and I was used to it on testosterone and I've seen how it's changed since I've started taking estrogen again. And this is just the shell that I live in and I see it for what it is as like a vessel. And I no longer really experience that kind of pain but when it, you're still young and you can still remember clearly and vividly what your body previously was like, that can awaken a lot of medical mm. grief, which I think can translate into very violent um, verbiage when discussing your own transition. Furthermore, I want to point out that the ones on the right, I don't think that they're environments that foster healing. I have been very fortunate in that my family, my friends, everyone has been super caring and understanding for my situation. And they have never tried to force me into a box. Um, mm. Throughout my entire transition and detransition, it has always been what makes you happy. Um, and you are a whole and complete person, no matter what. Um, so yeah. I've been lucky with that. The environment that I'm in is really good for gender exploration <laughs> really good point like that yeah. is a really good point because environmental factors yeah, yeah like i can relate to that a lot through my own journey where like it was never <laughs> penalized it was never penalized for me to act or behave in any sort of way it was at school i was bullied a ton but 
in terms of like family and people that were closer to me, they're like, oh yeah, whatever, it's kid being a kid. So there was never like a harsh, oh no, boys don't do that. You shouldn't do that. And so I think that environment is really important when it comes to being able to have a more holistic view of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if someone has been really, maybe they've grown up in like an evangelical Christian sort of household where it's like, absolutely not. And I could understand that their view would be quite different. And some of the detransitioners that are very vocal about like, oh, I don't think anyone should be able to transition, yada, yada. I can sort of understand from a certain perspective where they're coming from because that for them, it's real for them, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's how they feel. However, it is neglecting everyone else's experiences and all the nuance in other people's experiences. And I want to know what are some of the misconceptions actually, some of the misconceptions that, or myths that, um, you know, the Chloe Coles of the world are, you know, putting out there and how would you address those? I mean, the main myths that they're putting out, um, yeah. I think that one of the most common ones is, uh, the most common one is the rapid onset gender dysphoria um claim mm, so this idea mm -hmm. that uh, uh for the viewers who don't know the listeners who don't know um the rapid onset gender dysphoria paper is a widely discredited uh paper that basically discusses that there is a group of uh young people who just rapidly develop uh this gender dysphoria and it's kind of like a social contagion so basically it's a trend um and i think that that is a very commonly cited myth but the funny thing is is that i was the first queer kid at my school like mm. i was the only openly queer, queer kid at my school this is not something that like yeah. i was taught by anyone um this was me articulating a problem that i had with my body um but they basically it, it's it's not um any kind of real science <coughs> So they like to per per perpetuate this myth that it is a trend when, um, like, uh, I think it was like left-handedness that used to have an occurrence of like 3%. Yeah. And then after it became like normalized, it was like 12%. Um, we're seeing a stabilization in pre presentation of queer identities as well. So it's like, mm -hmm. if you just let people do their thing, they're just going to be who they are. Like, that's not a social yeah. contagion. That's just letting people live um but other myths i mean there was one myth that i think that was kind of harmful but it's not necessarily one that's peddled by um prominent detransitioners it's this mm. idea that if you've suffered uh i'm not sure if i'm allowed to use a specific language on this but i'll just say it, uh child childhood sexual abuse or anything like that that mm -hmm. you're more likely to detransition but the thing is to my knowledge, nothing ever happened to me. And for a long time, I was like, well, that's one of those clear markers of detransition. I don't have it. Clearly, I must be trans. So it was a complete misconception that kind of also like held me back instead of like yeah. um, having, you know, more diversified, like <clears throat> instead of having a more diverse representation of what detransition stories could look like, um, I was just very... Whole, I was very much holding on to this particular misconception as like proof of like, well, it can't be me because, right. right? So that's something that I wish people would talk about more. That there's like, there's multiple reasons that people who detransition can have for their initial transition. And um, mm -hmm. if we have shame in talking about detransition, we will never be able to have a full breadth of understanding of what these stories could look like. Um, and that holds other people back. Mm. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what's up with my throat. You're all good. Um, I said we're having technical difficulties and verbal difficulties, so it includes coffee. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, <coughs> so I feel like a lot of those misconceptions and myths out there, they kind of lean on the one idea that is trans people aren't real. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, and 
day transitioners. Hello lovely, if you like what you're hearing so far, and I hope you do, then you are going to love the free trainings that I have. So these trainings have helped hundreds of my own clients and my followers get into a place of empowerment, loving their authentic selves with more hope, comfort, confidence and safety. And that is really what we're all about here. So if you're listening to this podcast, there's something for you, you know, trans or not, whether you're interested in trauma healing or, you know, learning to live a more empowered life in control life, or if you're just sick of your voice getting you misgendered, then these trainings break down my core methodologies to help you with all of that and more. And it's the methodologies that I use with all of my clients. So you can register for that via the link in the description box below. And I will see you there. Mwah. Now let's get back into the episode. As typically like the clubby coals and all of that are uh, very effective at putting that sort of story forward. <laughs> and for people that have a, um, a certain experience or a certain level of understanding, maybe they don't know any trans people. They've never, you know, grown up around any of that. And so they take to that really, really nicely. <laughs> which is very unfortunate to see. Um, but it's also understandable. It's also understandable <coughs> because like there are multiple reasons that could cause someone to think that they are trans when maybe they're not, or maybe they are on a certain mm -hmm. level, but they think they have to be binary, but they don't. And, mm -hmm. you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I wonder what do, what do those conservative detransitioners usually put forward? Cause I hear there's usually like, this desire to fit in, they'll call it a trend or a social contagion. They'll say a the doctor contagion. told them to transition. <clears throat> um, are there any others that are kind of prominent out there? Uh, the whole uh, escaping the patriarchy myth. Oh, um, mm -hmm. uh, that's also where um, the detransitioner detran like lizard emoji comes from, this idea that we're cutting off limbs to escape the danger that is the patriarchy um interesting that's a very yeah it's uh there's a lot of different narratives but like broadly speaking i i i see that there is like within the detrans uh online presence i guess you have the turf side you also have the religious side then you have just like the general right-wing transphobic side um mm -hmm. and they all and generally speaking the turfs will put forth the it's all the patriarchy's fault yeah. Um, and it's just very bioessentialist. And then you have, of course, the social contagion thing that's peddled usually by the right wing and religious. It's all the devil's work. That's that's yeah. kind of, uh, you know, so those are like how I, I visualize these like streams of mm. uh, transphobia, if you will, <clears throat> yeah, centered right. around detransition. Yeah. Oh, interesting it does prey on a lot of insecurities and worries that people have mm -hmm. and particularly oh, sorry what were you gonna I, say i was actually wanted to point something out it's like yeah i understand for people who do not like uh, I, I know you did an episode about uh, transphobia but like the understanding that people have and that people will latch onto a detransitioner's story is like proof of like mm -hmm. oh trans don't real but yeah. um the thing is and this i say this a lot i've tweeted this before i commented everywhere uh when people come into my comment section talking about like oh but if we regulated transition more then um we wouldn't have any detransitions oh, yeah. and i'm i want to point out i was not assessed like m my diagnostic period was that it was a period of time that's like months if not a full year of me talking to multiple doctors i was assessed by three different psychologists who each had to say lucy has gender dysphoria she needs to, uh, like you know back then he he should transition um so there's this like misconception of like oh well uh like, it's so easy to transition. That's why you have detransitions. No, I went through an incredibly rigorous diagnostic um, period and I still ended up detransitioning. But that is just a statistical inevitability. No matter how airtight you try to make mm. the system, 
there will always be detrans people and we should always approach anyone's gender journey with compassion and care yeah yeah i freaking love that and that's actually what i was going to go into just, just before <laughs> which is interesting um <coughs> because it's really like the thing that is paraded around a lot is the allowing gender affirming care for young people and how damaging that can be and i've had so many conversations with people around that because i started hrt at 16 um as well <laughs> we're very similar um, in that regard i know it's interesting our, our timelines it? line up really well yeah that's very interesting and i also had to jump through a lot of hoops to get to that point um and through like my journey i actually ended up I don't recommend it for anyone, but I ended up self-medicating um, because I had to wait till I was 18. That was one of the hoops. And I also had to talk to multiple psychs and letters and all of that. And I just wonder, because that's where a lot of the fear is. It's like, if we just let people jump straight into it, then they're going to do all of these things and they're going to regret it and they're going to have a horrible life or blah, 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 blah. And it's really this... Um, over catastrophization of the possibility mm -hmm. because whenever someone comes to me with that and they're like oh yeah but young people starting these irreversible changes and this that and the other i'm like what's actually the main risk there though because there's a big risk that if that person is trans and we're not treating it as a true thing they're going to feel unaccepted they're going to feel ostracized they're going to feel all the things that they feel and that's often what leads to a lot of trans suicide and so from my perspective it's like allowing someone to dive into a, even just like social transition that doesn't hurt anyone <laughs> that's doesn't. the only problem is the transphobia associated with it the root is transphobia because the issue that people have with detransition is oh there's all these irreversible things done to your body mm. and it's like the only reason why you demonize that is well i mean aside from the potential risk of gender dysphoria in the detrans person mm. themselves but the only reason why you you demonize that is because you don't like transition bodies you know what i mean so it's like and this in especially in the context of detrans women like myself it is and i've, I've mentioned this before it is ultimately about controlling female bodies because there's this in which then ties back into like white supremacy and like we need to make sure that we have fertile wombs so we can propagate mm. the christian white race so that's like kind of how it really really go gets into like those yeah. typically american right-wing values that's how it all connects together there so um yeah it's it's <sighs> Because so much of the damaging propaganda that is peddled ab about detransition is like, oh, these young women, they're losing their breasts and their ability to have children and blah, 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 and this, that, and the other. And it's like, well, I mean, add laser hair removal later. And I mean, my voice is deep, but um, a lot of people like my voice, so I don't really care. <laughs> um, and also, why... Um, so... In, also, I don't really mind the fact that I've had top surgery. I have a bit of my issues with my scarring, but that's it. Um, and also this obsession with like, oh, but can you have kids? Because um, I was in a, a TV show here in the Netherlands and people online were talking about my fertility. And mm -hmm. that really blew my mind that people felt so entitled to my body that they felt that it was their place to be concerned about my ability to have children when that has nothing to do with them. It is yeah. um, appropriation of women's bodies, basically. Mm. Um, of female bodies. Uh, and meanwhile, um, I, I just want to get into this because this is also something that's been on my mind. Um, D-trans men are not portrayed in media. And the reason for that is because trans women are um characterized as predators by right wingers they cannot see like and then so a detrans man cannot be seen as a victim because well he was do he was doing it just because he wanted to uh you know for self-gratifying reasons you know <coughs> so um 
everyone loses in this game is kind of what boils down to. Yeah. <coughs> there can be I mean, no that's... compassion. It is either condescension or it is uh, basically dismissal. Yeah. Those are your options. That's true the whole freaking way. Like when it comes to transphobia, there is no winning with it because people are going to have their perspectives. They're going to mm -hmm. paint things in certain ways. They're going to be worried about your fertility when mm -hmm. it's just, it's painting mm. someone else's expectations and someone else's experiences on everyone else and expecting mm -hmm. that, oh, if I was in that position, this is how I would feel. So, okay, great. Mm -hmm. That's one person. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I, to everyone yeah, consider, wow. uh, concerned about my fertility, um, you're not me. You're not any of my partners. Uh, what what what's it to you? Why are you yeah. thinking about what happens when? Um, to put it bluntly, why are you so obsessed with what happens when a guy nuts in me? That's the thing, because <laughs> that's what it is. That is literally <laughs> what it is. Like that's the yeah. only and. And then that you can put, you can kind of like draw a line to like sexualization. Like it all is just one big mess of bigotry. That's what it is. Mm. <laughs> wow. It's really interesting. Sorry. So, am I allowed to say we... that? <laughs> oh, it's, there's, we just say whatever on here. So when it comes to, policing young people going into transition as someone who started transition at a young age and had to jump through those hoops and everything like what advice do you have around that how could someone know that perhaps it is uh you know they are actually trans or maybe they're not or is it not even about that is it about like it just kind of is what it is and explore and find out. I think that if you are not, sh if you are not sure about hormones, hold off on them because hormones are incredibly powerful and they will change your body no matter what. And no matter if you've undergone uh, gynogenic puberty and androgenic puberty, you will definitely be become either masculinized or feminized depending on which hormones you take. I don't feel like that that is something that people need to be as concerned about um so if you're not sure hold off on it but i will also say that i took testosterone for eight and a half years and i feel like uh, it, it's fine i walked through basically all the steps the almost the entire checklist of things that you would associate with a binary trans masculine experience i did that um, mm. just bar bottom surgery. I only didn't do meta or fallow. That was it. And I still detransitioned. And my life's good. It's okay to, to not be entirely sure and to try out, but know that if you do anything, yes, it will change you, but yeah. that doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's only a bad thing. If you think it is, it's about your framing of it. Mm. That's a really interesting perspective for me because prior to starting HRT, I was really scared about it. I was like, I don't know if this is right for me. I don't know if this is something I actually want to do um, because I liked a lot of androgynous sort of features. I liked the idea of having a pretty feminine face with long hair and no breasts. Like I really enjoyed that. That was my sort of role models at the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, like, like bending the binary, I freaking absolutely loved it. And I still do. Mm -hmm. However, it was almost like this thing of I'm going to do it and see how I feel. And for me, that was great. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, I'm actually not thinking about <laughs> um, all of this stuff as much as I was. I'm not worrying about my hair growing on my face or I'm not worrying about this, that, the other. And for me, it was fantastic. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I guess this is right. But as well, it is a it is a decision that can be scary and can be uncertain. And there's never a hundred percent certainty. I think that's the scary part for people is there's never going to be a hundred percent certainty, and because when you know, you know. <laughs> right. It's kind of one of those things sometimes. Is anything ever 
a completely certain in anyone's life. Nothing is. Um, but the main point is that you give yourself space for evolution. Yeah. And to, to explore what your identity really is, who you are. And it's funny you, you're talking about like, okay, so the initial changes you underwent um, taking HRT. Because like when my voice dropped, I was so happy. I loved it. Mm. I felt so empowered and cool and masculine with my new shiny voice. Um, I mean, after all the cracks had kind of like smoothed out. Yeah, um, after you've stopped going, like, oh. after, after, yeah, yeah, yeah. after <laughs> that stopped, I was like, yeah, I really love this. I felt good. Um, or like seeing my hairline square out initially, seeing my jaw widen and all that stuff. Um, then when I started doing sports more, seeing my body change like that, that all made me happy. But now mm -hmm. I look in the mirror and I look at my hips and I'm happy. So like, mo like yeah. just because you, f you feel happy at one point doesn't mean that, that happiness is invalid because you feel happy about something else later down the line. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So what do you, what does that mean to you? Like, just forgive yourself. Just be be kind to yourself realize that you can feel things at different times and i i i said this the other day um i don't see the young man that i once was as delusional i had to uh clarify that at some point i don't see him as stupid or any or like immature or anything i see a young man who was working with the best knowledge he had available it was yeah. i had stuff to go off and at the time it just fit me and i was by all accounts a man a trans man mm -hmm. um and just because i'm a d trans woman now doesn't mean that that was wrong i don't know i i, I underwent so many like massive life events that identity and it all felt real to me it's just that i'm i've just uh, changed my shell a little bit now mm. um, it's kind of where i'm at now i there's a couple of things i want to touch on with that because yeah. what you just mentioned is a very empowered mindset it's like i don't look at that younger version of me as delusional or stupid or didn't know what they were doing or whatever and that is like a core thing that i <laughs> i scream from the rooftops all the freaking time is that you're always doing the best you can with the resources you have and i think that kind of mindset really allows that compassion for yourself but also, oh my gosh, there's so much I want to go into on this. I got all night. Don't worry. <laughs> my goodness. Yeah, it's really getting late for you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, understanding that there can be gender fluidity as well. And this is where a lot of contention is. And I've seen it so much recently, the erasure of non-binary people and identities outside of the binary and that's you know I'm, i can talk about that mm. all day but i recognize that a lot of people's gender is a lot more fluid it doesn't necessarily fit into the binary mm. and i don't think many people's does i i just think a lot of people don't think about it and they don't explore things and find out those things about themselves so for me, like worst case scenario, oh my goodness, you've gone into transition and then realized that it wasn't for you. Great. You know so much more about yourself than the general populace. How cool. But a friend of mine, that's not so scary. Like why, no, why not. is that so scary? A friend hmm. of mine pointed out to me, um, he said, you've probably saved yourself a midlife crisis. I think I did. <laughs> Maybe. I, I feel so, since I've had this experience of transitioning and then detransitioning, I can do literally anything. There's nothing I can't do. I've done the hardest things I possibly could do. Yeah. Navigating difficult social situations, having to go through a completely different um, experience of life, uh, seeing the world from so many different lenses. I've had all that. I've faced challenges where I had to 
I I face the the you know challenges that you typically associate with 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 mm-hmm. men in that I was not able to express emotions at certain times that I had to step up and also take care of my family in some kind of way and I I've had insecurities from both sides i know what it's like to feel insecure as a guy in terms of your appearance i know what it's like to feel uh, insecure about your appearance as a woman as well like i've seen so much of it and i've overcome all of it Mm. i've beat it all so why would i think that i can't do anything i can do Mm. like now it's it's seriously a problem like people i'm interviewing for jobs what do you think is an obstacle i don't know what an obstacle is anymore i've (laughs) I fought back against everything. I've beat the game, basically. I won against myself in the best kind of way. That is like using those experiences as a growth tool and a learning tool and using it to better your life. And I think that's what a lot of those public detransitioners don't do. It's very much the victim mindset. It's the doctor made me do this. They made me think that it's them, them, them. And oh, poor me, I'm the victim. Everything's so horrible in my life now. But if they shifted that perspective, it's actually the fact that they are, oh gosh, I'm worried about that. But they're kind of victimizing themselves in a lot of ways. They're choosing that mindset, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. I have something to say with that to that. I think yeah. that it's not so much them personally. I think it is the external forces that are at play here because mm. they have a vested interest in being surrounded by people who constantly victimize them for the promotion of hatred, basically. If they yeah. are anything but a victim, then how like of course and I, I've experienced this as well in like how I've been portrayed in media. You can say, you can literally say with your full chest, I'm not a victim. But the moment that they put like a little sad bit of music underneath it, then it's like, oh no, even if you're not a victim, we're still going to victimize you. It's still condescension because that's what, yeah. it's not true compassion what you're getting on the right wing. It is condescension. It's like, oh, you poor baby. And it's like, that's not what I need. I, I just need uh, a place to put my medical grief and a place for me to be open and honest about my experiences so that other people can learn from them as well. Um, yeah. I don't, uh, and I, I don't think anyone benefits from being told constantly by the people around them that they were mutilated, ruined, oh, st- yeah. destroyed. Cause it's it, the way, the language you use to refer to yourself is so important in how you see yourself. I'm, I'm not a victim. I never will be. I was a young man making decisions for myself. And now I'm a young woman making decisions for myself. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Oh, I love that you've pointed that out because it expands my worldview a little bit as well. Because when you hear something over and over and over, it's literally, it's freaking hypnosis. Like it's programming you to believe Mm -hmm. certain things. And it would be quite difficult to not view yourself as a victim if you've got all these people going, oh, you've mutilated and you've done this, oh, you poor thing, you can't Mm -hmm. have children now, you poor thing, this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. It'd be kind of hard to stand up against that and go, wait, no, like that's, um, so thank you. That's just helped me to have more (laughs) compassion as well. (laughs) You're very welcome. This is what I preach on my platforms. That's what it's all about. Mm. I don't want, that's why I want to portray detransition as something neutral and just something you do to feel more at home in your body, just like transition, literally anything you do. Um, in that regard. So what gives you, like, what do you feel gives you that courage to stand up against that and to take that empowered mindset, to not put yourself in victimhood or to not allow others to victimize you? What's the difference like, there? You mean like what, what, what motivates me or like? <laughs> All I'm thinking of is the freaking meme video. I'm built different. <laughs> like yeah. what? Um, I'm sorry. But what allows you to be able to stand up to those things and to reject that victim identity? I mean, it was okay. So I want to kind of like tie this with like my whole TikTok thing, because I started doing that in like May last year. Mm -hmm. Um, What empowers me to stand up like that is like this realization that there aren't a lot of voices out there like mine. If I don't do it, someone else is going to do it. 
and I think that I'm the right person for the job, <laughs> just to put it bluntly. Yeah. I think I have to say something because I have thick skin. I know myself. I'm so, I, I've gone, like I said, I've gone through all the challenges. I have to stand up and I have to right the wrongs that I see in front of me because I was, I, the, the reason why I started making videos to begin with is uh, Ollie London. I don't know if you're familiar with him, mm. um, but yeah. he, <laughs> right. Um, so for quick summary for people who don't know, Ollie London is a guy who spent um, an inordinate amount of money on trying to look like Jimin from BTS, um, briefly identify as non-binary, then transition, uh, transitioned with the goal of becoming Rosé from Blackpink. Um, and then detransitioned, and then now he's now doing the right wing talk show circuit as a detrans man, right? Okay, now and everyone's uh, on the same page. Seriously. But anyway, I don't, I don't. But <laughs> okay, so um, he did all that, and he tweeted something, and I was like, I don't want this to be the representation. Someone's got to mm. do it, and that's what kind of pushed me to do it. And then after I started making videos, I think I had a a little over a thousand followers on tiktok someone reached out to me and she said i have the exact same situation as you i was on testosterone for eight years i've had an overhysterectomy top surgery everything um and i want to detransition but i felt so alone i'd never seen anyone like me mm. and reading that message gave me basically all the energy i needed to push me forward and yeah. keep me doing everything else because now I get more messages from people being like, finally, I see someone who I recognize. It's like, okay, so clearly there are people out there who feel similarly, who feel alone. If I can make them feel a little less alone, then it's fine. And then every message I get from every young trans person who's like, seeing you makes me confident to transition because if I detransition, I'll be okay. That's another boost of motivation. So I'm just like, I, I, I'm, I don't want us to, I don't want us as in like people who detransition to be seen as victims, propagandists, like we're just people. We're just people who are doing what's right by ourselves. That's it. Yes. I freaking love that. Cause that, that and I love dunking on bigots. <laughs> like that would be Sorry. the barrier for a lot of people is almost this like shame peddling that is pushed on people who decide to detransition and that you know if i get into the psychology of it it literally lowers somebody's status which causes them to be on the outskirts of their community which is actually unsafe to our nervous system so it's actually a threat to our survival at least is how it feels it can be a threat to our survival to make that decision and that's just like People prey on that. People prey on that and push that on people. And I'm so, so glad that your voice is out there to actually be a light for those people and so that people can see that it's not all doom and gloom. It's not. It's not I'm, the end of the I, world. I, I, mm. I, it's funny you bring this up because um, I, I, excuse me, someone reposted one of my videos on uh, a 4chan subreddit oh dear and i know that that's a bad start to a story <laughs> but specifically <laughs> this was a 4chan subreddit for trans people oh. and i was initially very scared because i was like okay um what are they going to say about it but my buddy linked it to me and he was like dude they they really they like you and i just checked it out i was like so people would be like oh i'm sorry um i hope that she's uh happy and i like i was uh, someone literally said i was scared to be so delusional about myself and i just chimed in and i was like don't worry i'm really happy and then actually got some really nice responses from these 4chan users um wow. basically saying like oh wow this actually makes me feel a lot better uh also considering 4chan is quite a toxic place um i don't think that they get to experience that much uh soft words mm. gentle speak so i figured that it was important for me to come in and be like don't worry don't worry everyone like i'm i'm happy i appreciate the the well wishes and stuff um but just most of all be kind to yourself because i feel like a lot of toxic spaces online don't really allow room for that i i think that i just also want to encourage people to like be very mindful of um 
the company you keep uh, online and like make sure that it's like empowering and uplifting and not people who tear you down for being too tall, too short, too fat, too this, too, too that. Because <coughs> that's not um, conducive to your personal development in any way, shape, or form. Sorry, keep going. Oh. With the that's what this all, that's the purpose. <laughs> the <tensions laughs> are where the gold is. But I'm interested um, because when you say you saw like Ollie London and like those types of voices being prominent out there, and that was a motivator for you to be like, I want to share my experience. What do you feel makes your experience? I'm, I'm going to say a more empowered experience. Like from my perspective, it's a more empowered perspective or view mm -hmm. of your experience because we know that another person potentially with all the exact same experiences that you've had could have a totally different perspective on it. Right. Mm -hmm. We spoke a little bit before about, um, you know, upbringing wise and how it was, um, you were allowed to sort of make those mistakes and stuff. Right. Do you feel like that's partly the reason why you have the perspective you do, or are there other things that have contributed to that? Damn. Um, I really do think I put it down to mostly my environment. Yeah. I really do think that if you are around people who just let you be and just accept you for who you are, any kind of change, um, any kind of transition, detransition, uh, can go a lot smoother and you can have that more empowered perspective of yourself. Cause like I said before, I really, really hate the kind of language that I hear right wing is using about mm. detrans people. Um, trying to think of other factors that would contribute to um this view of myself uh, yeah I, I i really do think that it was like the people around me i'm trying to think of like other stuff that would contribute to it but mm -hmm. i i think that the support net network is something that's important to get get right for someone mm -hmm. um and also like the, the thing is it's also like it's down to timing as well because even in times where I had like a decent support network, but I was like not kind enough to myself, um, that hindered me. Cause there, were, if if I look back on like my transition and points that I could have detransitioned, um, there are times that I could have, but I don't think I would have been yeah. ready to do it. I don't think I would have been able to, um, give myself like that kind of mercy. I would be very needlessly cruel to myself. Um, I had a brief stint where uh, I wasn't eating very well in 2019. Or like, uh, I was also off hormones. There were a lot of things happening at the time. Um, and I guess detransition might have like crossed my mind, but I was like, "What are you talking about? Like, you're a dude. You've you've been you are a man." Um, man up, get over it. Uh, very strange. Um, so like it crossed my mind, but I don't think I would have been able uh -oh. to be as kind towards myself if I had detransitioned then. Cause I was already so hard on myself. So yeah, mm. just treating yourself with a bit more grace and respect, uh, and actually listening to yourself a bit better. Um, yeah. it's probably the way to go. Okay. Yeah. So interesting thing I want to point out there is mm -hmm. like that environment is very important, but here's the thing, like environment timing. I worry that, you know, some people will potentially hear that and go, oh, well, those things are out of my control. You know, I grew up in this environment, yada, yada, and think it's all out of their hands. But the reality is the perspective that you're putting for like if this from my perspective is quite a healed version of you. It's like a healed perspective. Um, and anyone can achieve that. Like it doesn't matter what environment they've grown up in or the people they've mm. been around, they'll have more to heal. They'll have more things to go mm. through before they can show themselves that self-compassion and everything. But I want to make sure that people know as well that that's possible for everyone. That's um, it really is. Mm. so down to like the environmental thing um if you have toxic friends or people who bring you down 
maybe talk to them less. And I can assure you that there will be many more people out there who will accept you for who you are. And mm. in regards to the timing component, that timing had more to do with um, how hard I was on myself and that I just needed to mature a bit more. Yeah. And that's something that you can accelerate a bit by actively practicing kindness towards yourself and being forgiving mm. and understanding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, that's massive. Yeah, it is within your control. And that's <laughs> definitely a, a takeaway I want people to have as well from that is a lot of those things are within your control. I mean, you can't you can't control where you've grown up and like your first seven years of life. Like that's it's obviously no. Which is unfortunately, you know, from seven fourteen, that's kind of the period of time where a lot of those deeper things can be ingrained. They can also be uningrained, which is not really a word, but they um they can be worked on. So it's not completely out of someone's hands if that's the case. Um, but it's really interesting that that's the main thing that you've noted there because it shows how much that really has an impact on people that if you're living in an environment where you are accepted where it's okay to make mistakes and people love you no matter what that is so freaking powerful holy guacamole wow um but really good point as well about like if you've got those friends in your life that are bringing you down or disempowering you, whatever maybe stop talking to them as much, all of that, because those types of things are within our control and within our power as well. I often talk about, you know, my family life and how I just, I say now that I cut people off like fingernails if they're not good for me, <laughs> if they are not helping <laughs> me or making me feel good about my life. I'm like that there is no purpose for me to be interacting. Um, mm -hmm. I get that not a lot of people are as cutthroat as that, <laughs> but I credit a lot of, um, you know, my perspective, uh, perspective to being able to do that as well. And I think everyone can bring in an aspect of that because generally we know if we're around people that just make us feel crappy or they bring us down or mm -hmm. make us feel bad about ourselves. And you deserve more than that. Like speaking to everyone oh, yeah. who's right. watching, listening, you deserve so much more than that. Oh my goodness. So a lot of what you post about around like the trans and detrans solidarity, I just want to know what does that mean to you? Like the solidarity between trans and detrans. I feel like it's centered around looking at the parallels of our experiences rather than what sets us apart or what gets in between us. So like right wing propaganda. Um, TERFs, all of that. <clears throat> um, it's not about, oh, well, she was assigned female at birth and now she identifies as a woman, so she has absolutely nothing in common with the trans community. Um, I need to take estro every day of my life. I get misgendered on the phone sometimes. Um, sometimes I worry that I haven't, like, you know, I need to upkeep my uh my facial hair what's left of it like i feel like those are pretty trans femme coded experiences um i relate so much to uh to the content that i see from trans women and trans femmes on my for you page on tiktok wherever mm. i want to like have solidarity there like we have so much in common in our day-to-day -day lived experiences and ultimately ultimately in a way we're still gender variant people that white wingers either put down victimize hate whatever you want to call it just they don't like us um and i feel like if we stand in solidarity together solidarity together um it's going to be much easier to advocate for bodily autonomy and gender affirming care mm. for everyone because i need gender affirming care my estrogen yeah. is gender affirming care your rights are my rights and it serves us both to work together to protect them. Um, yeah, so I need gender affirming care because, well, I take estrogen, you take estrogen. That's something that we have in common already. My bodily autonomy is your bodily autonomy. My rights are your rights. If we work together, we're so much more powerful against these right wingers if we stand shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, yeah. 
And that's a theme that I want to see more, like not just between trans and detrans people, but with everyone, humans in general have so many more commonalities than we do differences. And I think if people connected based on that and connected based on those commonalities, that there would be so much more compassion across the board. Because it's only when you get into all of the freaking nitty gritty details that don't even matter mm -hmm. where there's conflict. And it's, yeah, it doesn't serve anyone. It's not helpful for anyone. So I absolutely freaking love that. And looking ahead, I want to know, you know, what do you hope to see more of in terms of societal attitudes, policies, you know, regarding detransitioning and trans rights in the future? So regarding trans rights, I would like to see them promoted. Uh, well, I want to see them protected, promoted, <laughs> uh, just around the world, um, implemented where they're not present. Um, and ultimately, the main goal of the content I put out is to destigmatize detransition. I want it to be seen as something that is completely politically neutral. I don't want people to detransition and then people assume that they're a turf. I don't want people to look upon detransitioners and detrans people as these broken individuals where people who exercise our bodily autonomy um, once and we're doing it again. Yeah. So, yeah, Love that. just I hope that my uh, content helps with that mission. Yeah. Oh, so this has been freaking epic i have um usually i like to try to keep these to like an hour or below but there's so much that i've wanted to dive into with this as a final question for you i'd like to know what advice you have for people that are maybe considering that detransitioning what advice do you have for them Oof. um well number one never talk to media uh just uh that's just as a general rule of thumb, be very cautious about that because our stories are very powerful. But most of all, towards yourself, not for the outside world, internally. If you detransition, I think that the most important thing is for people who are considering to detransition, be kind to yourself. Take things slow if you have to. Uh, I've been in contact with some young trans people who are considering detransitioning and they're some they're taking it slow like I know someone who has just recently bought earrings for themselves for the first time in yonks mm. <laughs> um and they're just like playing with their a more feminine expression considering and seeing what actually feels right for them I think that the, just be kind to yourself as well and Rome wasn't built in a day. You don't have to label things if you're not ready to. Um, and you don't owe anyone your story. I share my story because I feel like it's important to, but you don't have to give anyone receipts for where you've been um, and how you feel. It's all up to you. Okay, so that has been an epic freaking conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and expanding our minds. I know my mind has been expanded throughout this. And I'm wondering where can people go to learn more about you, the things that you're putting out there? Right. So uh, you can find me usually on TikTok. I go live every Monday and Wednesday at 2200 CET. Um, I'm also on Twitter and I'm also on Instagram. And since my username is really, really long, I'm sure that Jasmine will have the links to all my profiles in the description. Yes, absolutely. Cool. <laughs> I would very much recommend you go and follow because just we need more voices like that. We need more voices that are spreading that empowerment and that are spreading compassion and understanding. It is so, so important. So go give her a follow. And, oh, yes, beautiful. So thank you very much. And that is all for us for this one. So Thanks for coming along. Thanks for listening. And I will see you in the next one. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Trans Boss Podcast. 
If you support the Trains Boss movement, it would help immensely if you could leave a review on your favorite podcasting app, follow us, and share your biggest takeaway from this episode on social media. Don't forget to tag me at jasmine.vine on Instagram because I would love to see it. Now get out there, do the things, and take the next step into that empowered life you deserve. See you next time.